Hello everyone, Sam Ekman here from Gold Derby with Florian Hoffmeister from True Detective Night Country Cinematography. Uh, when I think of this season and I think of the cinematography, uh, the shots that immediately spring to mind are kind of the ones that are outside on the ice. There's a single light source and the camera is kind of staring past that light into like the infinite darkness. Uh, what was your approach to kind of working in a show with all of that darkness in the landscape? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you did, you you described it so beautifully. Really, I mean, it it really condenses it to the to the very very core of of what we're trying to convey. Because you know, I um um I always felt well. There's a few things that I felt. One was um. I was quite interested in if you reverse the question. So if we obviously we are in a world that's very dark, but we are also in a world where we only we create the light. So there is no other light but the artificially created light that humans actually need to stay alive in those uh, surroundings. So I was quite interested in finding something, you know, and, and thinking about lighting uh, differently and not necessarily only from the uh idea of beautification or aesthetization that you know that comes with a field of cinematography um but to think about light more in a utilitarian uh way you know how would people uh treat lighting if they spend all their night all their winter in darkness and um i i sometimes feel you know when we seek for inspiration i personally like music a lot and uh, I somehow had this idea and this feeling that the lights, the highlights, so to say, they should feel like screaming guitars, you almost like feedbacks. So it shouldn't be timid. There should be an inherent feeling of danger to it. So that when you, when you have this feeling that you need them, but they also are more apparent and brighter and harsher than maybe in a, your usual environment. Me personally, I live in Berlin and, you know, in the winters I do like it quite moody but when i spent the winter in iceland i you know found out by just observing myself is you tend to switch on every single light that you have in this room you know because you you create your own day and night so there was that bit of the of the uh the highlights you know they should they were supposed to be hard and harsh and utilitarian and not necessarily always beautiful and then there was the darkness and the darkness, I think, you know, I always thought should feel like if you switch that light off, it'll just, you know, swallow you. Mm -hmm. And and that is the, the and between those two points, I was trying to, in the middle of that, this is where the image would live, you know, between these highlights, like the screaming guitars, and on the other side, the the darkness that could swallow you. And you know, there's there come very many practical things with such an approach. First of all, we you know, we designed a, what uh, in professional cinematography is uh, referred to as a LUT, a lookup table. So we created our own look that would uh, in re react in this form to those highlights and to the to the blacks. Um, and then, you know, there's also very, you know, more practical creative decisions when you shoot that, you know, for example, you go into a snowfield, but you will only have a single person with a flashlight in a hand, you know, or sometimes you might opt to uh, depict space differently and have bring other lights, uh, but it's a constant conversation actually that you're having with the darkness. Mm. It's really interesting you mentioned the kind of uh, the the that characteristic you're giving to the light because for so many of the interior locations where there is artificial man-made light, a lot of those interiors feel very uncomfortable. Like I remember, yeah. uh, you know, the the research center, which is the uh, home base yeah. for a lot of the show. I was like, I don't know how these guys could feel comfortable here. That even though it's a safe haven from the cold, there's something, you know, off about it or too harsh about it. Why was that the atmosphere you were looking to create? Well, you know, the scripts had like, for me, had like three levels when I read them. And th those were the intriguing things as well. You know, first of all, it's a who's done it. It's a cop show, you know, it's a genre piece. And Issa Lopez, the writer and showrunner, had constructed a real interesting arc. And I, when I read all the episodes, 
I caught myself like around episode three, really starting to think what is actually going on here. So that was the, the first level. Second level that I thought was very intriguing is, uh, you know, um, uh, the idea of a supernatural so that dead people would, you know, potentially resurface and people would see him. And that's uh, also a trait of, you know, Isa Lopez's uh, own filmmaking that she she had made this beautiful film called Tigers um, that plays with themes like that. So that also felt very common. And, uh, you know, I, I sense that the cinematography would um, somehow have the one of these tasks to fulfill is maybe to to concentrate less on the who's done it, but more on the atmosphere in which the supernatural can can arise. But the third uh, and probably more important element to answer your question is it also felt as if there is a story she was telling about uh, our own disconnect, a disconnection between people that, you know, either within family or within friendship that have problems to connect to each other, but also to connect to the land or the environment that surrounds us. Um, and this kind of disconnect that I think I associate with a feeling of being uncomfortable. And that is something that I think uh, is somehow a sleeping idea that kind of, or something that uh, just creeps in through different elements of the show and uh, is like a, a, a reigning yeah, atmosphere. I, that was very important to me, at least I thought that, you know, you should always feel like any, you know, first of all, you have to feel alert for those themes of horrors that something could happen, you know, that's the discomfort, but also this feeling that, you know, you are out there on the ice and, you know, if if the heating stops, you'll die and, and you're alone and, you know, you try to get some connection with the people around you and you fail and you miss something and you have sorrow so these themes i think the cinematography also tried to elevate past the uh you know the bigger thing of the who's done it and the case and the genre well speaking of atmospheres like that one of my favorites i think in terms of locations and the way you shot it was the ice caves uh yeah. that the two leads are going through towards the end of the show because they're it almost feels like the the light is coming and reflecting through and around all the ice walls um and there's a lot of tension, but also wonder to it. How did you mm. create that effect mm. in those sequences? I, I have the feeling you speak far better about all this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. It's been a long day. I hope that, you know, I, I really appreciate the interest, curiosity, also not only of you, but yourself, but also all your viewers. I hope I'm, I'm making sense um, because the sense of wonder is something that I really cherish. And it's something that is just, you know, in the daily grind of having to create these images and working with these crews under, you know, economic circumstances where every minute counts, that sense of wonder is sometimes something that gets sacrificed very quickly or that you can't feel anymore yourself when you work there because you're so busy trying to, you know, somehow survive the shooting day. But that aside, um, the the ice caves were a beautiful uh, challenge for various reasons. One was, you know, it's the opening of episode six. And I always thought what a privilege it is to have, you know, this big episode that is like the payoff episode. It's a proper finale. If this had been, you know, the, the a, a one running film, it would have been a worthy finale for, you know, the last act of the film. And to start that with a sequence that's roughly five minutes where hardly anything is spoken and you just, with these characters uh, that you have grown very fond of and you experience a world that they haven't seen either. So you can share that what you might, uh, you know, have depicted as uh, and picked up as the wonder. We are really with them and we are discovering a world that's also unknown to us. So that I thought was a fantastic opening. Technically, you know, we had shot 112 shooting days. We had roughly on uh, True Detective and 47 of those we shot at night outside. So the general tone of the show was really authentic. It was out on those ice fields. But, you know, it goes without saying that obviously we couldn't shoot in a real ice cave. So that was 
and so the the technical challenge was authenticity was really important so you know you you had to it still had to feel of the same language of the same reality as all the other episodes and then there was a very important thing that was very uh, that isa really stressed is you know i guess we can spoil it a bit because um the show has been broadcasted now obviously when they enter the world of the ice caves they cannot see the station and they and we have to feel that the length and the duration of their travel and the distance they travel is so great that they could not have ever and under any circumstances made that connection of that these uh, walkways would lead to that station they were it must be a complete surprise and she was very adamant about that and the outcoming effect of that was that we had to shoot a long trip and we had to create something that would really feel like a maze uh and obviously you know we had a stage in iceland that was slightly uh restricted in its size but the production designer dan taylor who i think did a fantastic job um built like three i think we had four elements roughly 100 meters all together and they were shaped in a way that we could you know that we could use them for certain parts of that trip at the same time when i was now thinking about lighting it what he had done it he had done different levels uh, and layers of uh, plastic materials he had you know, stacked the point you know up to a, a something that was probably this thick and it was half transparent so when you were shining light through it or at it, it really created that feeling of a three-dimensional ice block. Now you can light this softly, but then the light really gives away um, its uh, the uh, the, um, uh, um, the the unnaturalistic nature of the entire build. So I had to somehow mm. come up with something different, and we ended up using a very uh, a hard light that is more, you know, we had these lights that come more from a rock and roll stage lighting. These moving lights that create quite a hard light. And uh, we mounted them uh, over these tunnels and then we could constantly move them as well. Not within shot, but we could basically very quickly give like a piece of 20 or 30 meters one feel. And then we could turn, change the camera a little bit, change the lights a bit, and then it would feel completely different. And by that technique, we kind of created this trip that lasted, you know, hopefully it should feel like half a mile and not 100 meters. Yes, felt like quite a maze. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, each uh, iteration of, of True Detective is its own entity, its own story. Mm -hmm. This one does, like there were a few Easter eggs and callbacks to, to mm -hmm. season one and other moments. Did you ever feel like you needed to revisit those other seasons? to pull in different visual language in your storytelling or was it just i'm making my own thing here yeah no i never i never looked back i mean i you know i uh, i only i've only seen the first you know that was the yeah, the cultural icon that it is and the uh, groundbreaking uh, piece of television what it was back then you know um so i we, we never revisited i also thought that you know those easter eggs are pretty much in the script and it was, uh, I think it's one of the traits of uh, Issa's way of, you know, she sometimes used this metaphor, which I thought was quite fitting, that you sit around a campfire and people tell scary stories. And, you know, so you would reference things. So it, it is part of the real, the cultural, you know, the pop cultural identity uh, worldwide. You know, it is really an icon. So it's those references, I think, the way that I perceived it whilst we were shooting, you know, they felt more like, uh, um, like you know, uh, tipping your head. You know, like, mm -hmm. I think it was probably not, I don't know if it was really meant to be. I mean, only she can answer that. We never had a discussion like this. It was meant to be there for people to investigate. I think it was just, it was a sign of honoring, you know, that icon that the first season has become. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, to answer your question, sorry, I was probably more, uh, uh, <laughs> meandering away. Um, I never, I never really looked back. I always thought this should, be, you know, and, and actually, if you think about it, each of those seasons that they did had a very distinct, different uh, um, look. I think what 
probably speaks for them. And maybe that is the one thing that we share is that within themselves, they're very coherent. It's really their own world they create. So, you know, we have, we're always out there to create our own. Yes. Well, I wanted to ask you about uh, your a previous credit of yours, which was TAR because you you earned an Academy Award nomination. And then, so that's obviously a, a major moment. But then beyond that, I feel like this film, Tar, has become, uh, it, it's taken on a life of its own. I think it, people have turned it into memes. It has a, mm. it's had a really uh, like cult, you know, devoted fan base to it that keeps it in discussion. What has it been like watching that movie just kind of take on its own life on the internet? Oh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it will remain one of my, uh, just, I mean, it's very recent memory, obviously, because we shot it uh, three years ago, but uh, it, it was a very, very beautiful experience, you know, obviously very tense, you know, the, the, the making of the film is probably as tense as watching it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it, it, I, I think of it very fondly. I think, you know, I'm very proud of it then having, been able to work on it and I absolutely admire Todd, you know, for what he's done with the film. Yeah. So I mean it was sometimes if you put it in relation to uh True Detective, I thought it was an interesting experience because it's true. I I, I was nominated and it happened whilst we were shooting in in Iceland. And there it, it is a it's a weird thing that happens then because suddenly you kind of catch yourself, or I did catch myself a few times where I was thinking is this actually, you know, am I, you're trying to reach a same level, which is insane. You can never, you know, these are, are single events in your life and you can never, uh, you know, you can't, you have to stop looking back. You know, you have to look forward and you create something completely different. But there were moments when I was chasing myself a bit, where I found I was chasing myself, so... But fortunately, I've made peace with all of this now. <laughs> well, good. Well, we're glad you made peace uh, and beautiful work on True Detective Night Country. So thank you so much, Florian, for, for sitting down and discussing with me. Thank you so much. Thanks for your interest and thanks for watching. Take care. Mm -hmm.